Hi Alex. Hi. Uh, how are you? Nice, nice shirt. Good choice. Uh, thank you very much. At some point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rep the project. But uh, oh yeah. yeah, no, I was referring to what you said in the email. So just uh, so oh, you know. Oh yeah, that shirt. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's why that's why I've got this on actually. I had All right. A, so uh, you had an accident. Accident. The dreaded, with... the dreaded diaper off. Uh, yeah incident yeah right you know in that like one minute interval when you're switching the diapers yeah no i know i've been there i've been there uh yeah it's a lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> Dude, tell me yeah that. yeah it's a uh, like you said it's a risky moment yeah it's uh i'm going through the same stage now with my obviously my baby so uh it's the third time that you know this is uh happening third? i to thought me. it was the second holy cow yeah so so yeah oh, so you're, busy so we're you're we're a both. pro then you're a pro you, yeah. you don't make these you don't make yeah. these novices yeah no i still do it's just i i'm i'm not worried about them anymore <laughs> they don't <laughs> they don't affect me so uh anyway yeah so uh nice nice being here with you today so i guess how do we start uh how would you introduce yourself i'll let you int introduce yourself so we're, we're gonna talk about several things like ethnography anthropology what you do your projects but how would you describe yourself because i know you're into filmmaking so is that what you um, start with i would say um i am right now i'm a, a qualitative researcher um uh, with specializations in um tibetan area studies and uh, social and cultural anthropology. And then in my postdoc phase, I developed a research axis in uh, visual anthropology, which led to um, filmmaking, uh, documentary, educational documentary filmmaking, and um, ultimately uh, beginning to build a YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of who I am right now. I think of myself as someone in public facing uh, social science pedagogy. I suppose. Uh, I okay, yeah, like. that's interesting. Yeah, and that's uh, that refers to. Uh, we'll probably come back to this topic. We've talked about this before about uh, leaving academia. I pretty much discuss this topic with everybody I talk to, uh, but generally about this, yeah, two worlds basically, academia and outside of academia. Uh, but I guess, yeah, it's a very good introduction and very short and concise. So I guess what has been a theme in what you said so far is anthropology and obviously that's a part of what I want to talk to you about because and also ethnography so let me start by asking you a question because that's quite confusing it's not just uh, I'll be honest it's, it's for myself as well not just for the viewers because I do find this confusing so uh, ethnography and anthropology what what is the relationship am I let me just if I if I'm uh, to, to take a guess first, would it be true to say that anthropology is a general, more general, like a science, or I mean, like a discipline or field, and ethnography is something within it, so basically like a methodology or set of methods. Is that yeah, how I they mean, relate? That's, that's, that's fair to say. Um, generally, we mean like one of two things when we say ethnography. One is um, a type of publication. Right, it's kind of what anthropologists who do field work tend to produce as their first monograph or their first two books, um, and that's um, uh, usually very dry to read. But that's the publication of your ethnographic field notes, right? Um, so you can read ethnographies, which is something most students should do. Um, the other thing is ethnography as a method in qualitative social science, and it's kind of like I think of it as the most qualitative of all the the, the qualitative methods, um, and um, it's a ultimately a mixed methods approach to qualitative research, and the goal, uh, when it's done well, is to gain an insider's understanding of the environment in which you're living and working, while maintaining uh, a kind of we call it a edict attitude, a scientific uh, more objective, a scientific outsider's uh, understanding of the communities that you're living in and working in. Um, so an ethnography that you publish in the end is the, the when those two perspectives harmonize, right? And you can, to a certain extent, you never are an insider really, but um, insofar as you're able to uh, develop an insider's understanding, you articulate that and then analyze your observations using your uh, more scientific outsider's perspective. And um, it's it's an approach to qualitative social science that developed a long time ago, uh, the, the 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 dawn of the 20th century. Bronislaw Malinowski, famously, was one of the the early pioneers 
Um, and it started as a way of kind of pushing back against cultural imperialism. And um, the the feigned uh, non-objective uh, scientific perspective that was dominant in the social sciences um, through the 19th and, and early 20th centuries, and people, um, the phrase goes, you have to get off the porch, right? Rather than using uh, observations written by um, Jesuit missionaries in the field or by military commanders somewhere, uh, uh, you know, writing about their observations, uh, rather than using the observations of those untrained people. You would have people who trained in the languages and history of the cultures that they wanted to study and then went and lived there and tried to a certain degree to integrate, right? Um, so that's that's kind of the that's the the ethnographic ideal. You spend about a year somewhere um, and then observe a community in a sort of full yearly cycle and then write up your observations. It's come a long way since then, right? And there are many different types of ethnography, but um, that's the that's 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 the idea in a nutshell as a method. Yeah, as you said, I think it's uh, this will definitely be like this most uh, traditional view of ethnography uh, because, in fact, that's you know how it originated. I think, uh, as you said, it's come a long way since then, and and I think I just wanted to make it clear, you know, to people who are interested in this that. Nowadays, it's, it probably doesn't always require you, although, like I said, it's this romantic and very interesting view of, you know, going somewhere and actually spend, you know, living with a tribe, for example. Yes. Uh, but of course, you know, if you're a student in, you know, somewhere in England or whatever, any country, not that likely That's to happen. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, as you said, and also I like that you said, it's, it's probably the most qualitative of all methods or methodologies. Would that be because it's so unstructured because it kind of tends to be unstructured if you live there or spend time again not necessarily with a tribe like let's say you, you can have an ethnography of a specific profession like teachers in a certain institution mm -hmm. i suppose uh to some extent again i probably will have to stick certain boxes for that to actually be considered <laughs> ethnography so again it's as i said i'm still confused mm -hmm. about this but uh, would it be because it tends to be relatively unstructured? Because usually you have like uh, the ethnographers tend to have unstructured interviews, for example, because of course, again, you can't really sit and plan every single conversation with, you know, the members of the community that you're spending time with. So is that why you said it's the most qualitative? Yeah, yeah, I suppose what I mean is, um, you know, when, when you look at qualitative methods in general, you have, um, uh, no pun intended, but a lot of very structured things like, you know, everything from structured interviews to unstructured interviews, things that have very specific time frames that you organize in advance. Those are all uh, methods that you can deploy as part of ethnographic fieldwork. You can even do quantitative data collection as in ethnography. But what it refers more broadly speaking uh, to is a macro approach to fieldwork, I think. Um, we go to the field and um, uh, to a certain extent, we have to be very flexible once once we arrive, right? You don't necessarily you don't necessarily know what the ethnographic reality will be in the field on the ground. There are a lot of things that you can't anticipate. And um, the main method that we we like to say that we use, and there's a lot of um, kind of pearl clutching and hand wringing about about this, but um, uh, the method that we tend to use is what we call participant observation. That is, um, like I said. Uh, participating in the community as, as an insider while maintaining this kind of outsider's objectivity. And a lot of the methods when you read ethnography, um, uh, a, a lot of what we talk about is how difficult it is uh, to become an insider, uh, to become accepted as an insider in a community. Um, and you may have to do any number of different things. Um, and sometimes it never happens. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't work. Um, so in that sense, ethnography doesn't refer to one method. It refers to a very broad approach to field work with the specific goal of maintaining this insider's and outsider's perspective. And when I say field work, it doesn't have to be out in the, the field. Like you said, uh, you know, uh, the idea of going to study a tribe somewhere is, is relatively archaic, although we still do that too. Um, but you have, for example, um, digital ethnography where people study digital communities um, using the theories and methods of ethnography, trying to uh, you know, do participant observation to join or live in, uh, to play and live in a, in a community that plays MMOs, for example. 
um, to understand, uh, you know, whatever forms of doxing or communication that exist in those communities, but then being able to take a step back and use analytical terminology and, uh, you know, a scientific perspective to uh, structure and uh, make observations about that community that you've been in. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the, the field in a physical sense. Um, that field is more, more abstract, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, again, this, uh, the reason I find it interesting is because of what I said before. I, I know that people are interested in, in ethnography. Uh, however, because of that misconception, again, it just doesn't sound, you know, like something that you, you'd even want to try, you know, to begin to, uh, you know, to, to implement or understand, not to mention, you know, the approval from the university. So, so because of that misconception, people would definitely, you know, this may be a factor that uh, be discourages them from pursuing this. So it's very interesting that you mentioned, for example, digital ethnography, which is sounds like obviously something uh, very timely. Uh, another, I, I just made some notes. So I imagine uh, to, uh, talking about that insider perspective that you mentioned, that would be, must be quite challenging. That's one thing uh, to, uh, in terms of not just being able to collect the data, in terms of validity of your findings later, because there is always this problem of validity. And then, you know, how do you, by the way, in terms of observation, because we were talking about observation, that's a general problem of being that participant uh, uh, observer. I do have another video in which I talked about that, uh, or my guest talked about observation, but I always imagine uh, the question of validity, like I said, being quite a big uh, issue there, because then, you know, the questions would arise whether you you were that insider, you know, whether they would act as they did if you were not there, you know, was it sure. their natural behavior? So all kinds of problems, which I'm sure they, they obviously with good planning, possible to overcome them. And then again, gaining approval for this kind of a study, even if it's not to be, uh, you know, in that tribe <laughs> settings, but rather even digital ethnography must be quite challenging as well, because as you said, and I like it actually, but I can imagine again, people being overwhelmed by this idea of basically implementing everything that works, because that's what it's essentially about, you know, uh, rather than saying, yes, I'm going to have this interview, I'm going to ask these questions, you have to be flexible, which is, you know, like I said, what I actually like about qualitative research in general, you have to react, I guess, to, you know, what's happening, you have to make some decisions on the spot sometimes. So you can really, again, it, it, can be tra challenging. I would expect this to be challenging in terms of gaining approval, like uh, from you know from the university, because again, obviously, they would expect you to have a relatively good plan for what and when uh, you're gonna do. So, uh, so this must be challenging. But let's. I want to ask you about your experience uh, of uh, anthropology or ethnography or both. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 can you tell me a little bit about that and whether it re relates to the question uh, to the the concept of uh, is it anthropology of magic or ethnography of magic? Again, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I, I've seen both terms. So yeah, what yeah. is it? What is your involvement in that? What is your um, experience with that? Well, I did. Um, so I did my PhD technically in a Tibetan studies faculty. I worked in Tibetan cultural studies, Tibetan area studies, um, and lived in North India for about two years. Um, and then I, I organized my PhD with social science faculties um, to, for external supervision. But um, I did what we call multi-site ethnography, uh, which uh, uh, you might call uh, in a derogatory sense, uh, ethnography light. Rather than spending an extensive amount of time in a single community, um, I worked in uh, four or five different communities uh, over the course of two years. Um, what I was doing was um, a survey of the forms of divination, right? So um, seeing the future, as it were, uh, in um, Tibetan-speaking communities in North India. Um, so uh, yes, it was very much the, the anthropology of magic. And the method that I drew from was principally um, an ethnographic approach. But my interest um, wasn't so much in the performance of magic per se. Uh, that's something that we've been writing about in anthropology for a very long time, and some of the definitive works that we still cite constantly were written in the 19, or published in the 1940s. Um, Evans, Evans Pritchard's Witchcraft Oracles and Magic, for example, is um, an absolute uh, flagship uh, publication in the field. But what I was interested in is um, how people uh, use reading techniques, how, uh, 
I, I, they're called Mogyapkyan in Tibetan. Uh, this is a people that, that do divination. I wouldn't call them sorcerers. I might call them definers or astrologers. But um, how they use and read ritual texts when they do uh, quasi-magical practices. Um, that's what interested me the most. The, the most. Um, and so I compared, uh, I pioneered something that I like to call ethnophilology, uh, which I thought was a brilliant uh, term to coin until I discovered that it already existed. Yeah. As, as it's but, usually um, the case. And, yeah, but and, um, uh, I uh, uh, wanted to look at the way that um, uh, diviners, so you're doing uh, a form of lithomancy. So that's, this is divination with objects, dice, stones, um, balls of dung, whatever, right? Um, you cast your objects and then you refer to a manual to interpret the patterns or the numerical sort of uh, groups that are formed during the casting. And um, the texts are basically full of riddles. They're extremely difficult to read and understand. And I noticed that from situation to situation, the responses that the diviners gave were radically different and uh, depended on the social class, the gender the standing of the, the clients that they had uh, in each in each case. I want there a kind of me to theorize the uh, ritual specialists approach to uh, reading uh, texts, how they use those texts as interpretive tools um, uh, in performing uh, magic in effect. Um, so it wasn't just ethnography. When I say it's not just the ethnography of magic, there was also a lot of um, a lot of philology and close textual analysis that I had to do to translate texts, to situate them historically, and um, also to uh, use a lot of interviews, uh, to interview specialists, to discuss their understanding of the texts, and then compare what they say in interviews to how those texts are actually used on the ground. Um, that was the that was the the hard part actually, um, and the ethnographically speaking, the magic there isn't so much in um uh, in in any one particular method. It's in being accepted enough uh, in the community to be able to sit in on these closed door ceremonies, right? To not just uh, network with the ritual specialists, but also with people in the, in the the local community, so that they accept you as a kind of fly on the wall when they're talking about um, sometimes very private things, right? Uh, these are, you You go uh, in Tibetan communities in North India, you go to consult Mogyapkan, uh, diviners and astrologers for all kinds of things, um, and some of which are are not exactly public facing, right? So, um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's the work that I was doing. Yeah, all this is, is really exciting. And, and I keep thinking, uh, we just said that, uh, you know, ethnography, anthropology, all of that doesn't doesn't necessarily have to involve you know people going somewhere, living with some people, spending time with some people, which is but but you actually did so uh, so it's still you know possible I guess and again it, it just sounds very exciting and I keep wondering uh, how did you how do you gain access to you you did say it's challenging but like okay how do you do that how do you start how do you even where to start how did you end up being there and uh yeah that's a, that's a really good question um so the first thing uh you you have to prepare before you go to the field right obviously um so i studied uh, tibetan area studies beforehand i uh, worked a lot on classical tibetan which is that we always start classical and then um worked up to speak moderately effective colloquial tibetan uh, which is a very difficult spoken language and um, I then spent a lot of time studying uh the the specific area that i wanted to work in in, in north India, right? Then I went to the field and I thought that it would be, you know, easy. I'm just going to show up somewhere and talk to some people and, you know, it'll be fine, right? Um, they'll be so impressed with this white guy that speaks Tibetan, which did not happen. Um, I found that it was incredibly difficult to do the type the type of work that I wanted. Um, monks tended to accept me because of my textual knowledge, but some um, people in, in the communities that I was living in did not. And um, there's a, uh, there was one moment where everything changed for me, but it's, um, uh, I had um, a Clifford, what you might call a Clifford Geertz Balinesian cockfight moment. There's a famous story from uh, one of Clifford Geertz's books. He was having enormous trouble uh, being accepted in the um, society in which he was working. And one day he attended a cockfight, uh, chickens, right? Um, and um, in the middle of that, which was illegal, and in the middle of that, the police showed up. And uh, while he was an outsider before the police arrived, when the police showed up, but everyone fled together, right? And he ended up sheltering with a local family. And then the police came to interrogate them. 
and they uh, defended him against the police, right? And this was the moment, he says, when his insider-outsider status suddenly shifted, right? And all of a sudden, he was part of the in-group. Quite I, extreme, I had, quite um, extreme. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes <laughs> it, it can be that way. I mean, for me, my uh, my moment when that happened, I had uh, about six months of difficulty uh, gaining access to this one community that I wanted to work in. And then some monks from a local community invited me down to play football, uh, proper football, not American football. Um, and I played in college, yeah. And, yeah, um, I'm, gl I'm glad that you called it the proper one because that's what it is, yeah, football. but yeah, continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, uh, so I played played with them and um, they ended up inviting me back to, to play a few times. And um, uh, they called me Barthez, right? Because I play goal and I'm a bald guy, right? Like the, the, the goalkeeper. But um, when people from the local community started to see me playing football with these monks from this little monastery up the hill, I had this, there was this, all the walls came down, right? I was still an Inji. That's like, a, I was still a white guy, right? Um, obviously, obviously an outsider, but I was the weird Inji that played football with the Kagyu monks up the, the hill at the monastery. And from that point on, I became, I think, I was, you know, never, never an insider. But um, marginally more acceptable than the other the other NGs, the other people that would visit the community that didn't speak Tibetan, that didn't sort of hang out with people in the local tea shop, and everything became easier after that, right? Um, and it took it was random, like that was totally aleatoric. I didn't know if I would ever really be able to to develop any type of local credibility, um, and it just happened uh, almost through chance by being offered, you know, uh, to to play football for an afternoon. Um, that was my, you know, Clifford Geertz Polynesian cockfight moment. And that's not something, when I say you have to be flexible, that's not something that you can really plan for. You develop a lot of methodological tools um, and you learn the language and you learn the history where you want to work. Um, and then to a certain extent, that first step, that very big first step is up to you to develop credibility um, uh, and um, to, to, you know, slowly break walls down to find gatekeepers and do all of those those sort of little things that make people good qualitative researchers that you can't you can't quite teach to a certain extent you have to feel out with empathy and cultural understanding right um and that's the that's the magic in ethnography a little bit yeah that's that's uh, super interesting and exciting and uh it does sound like like quite an adventure obviously and um and i think what what you said about this again relates to qualitative research in general i often say that you know for interviewing for example you you can develop you can develop certain knowledge of course you'll be reading you, you can have this whole tool set but then at the end of the day it's about you know your people's skills you know whether you are a nice person you know to be to be around because uh, when you interview people you you want you know you want a rapport and uh, and and i always say just remember you know just try to be yourself basically try to remember that it's essentially is, is just a conversation so uh, so this is kind of same point obviously th i would say there's more at stake here in your story it sounds interesting it's probably not something to do for your master's study you know to go <laughs> <laughs> to tibet and, and get, try to gain that access because as you said it doesn't sound like something you can you know prepare for apart from having this uh, knowledge and methodology, uh, which is obviously crucial because then you will gain maybe more confidence and eventually uh, s this will, you know, as in your case, uh, at least this will not be your problem. You won't really worry about your, you know, skills and methodology. So you can f entirely focus on the, the real problem, you know, how do I, for example, gain yeah. access to a community. Yeah, this, this is very interesting. And, uh, and I know that because of this, because of what you do, because of your interest and expertise and knowledge, uh, you are currently working on a project that also has to do with Tibet. And also, and you mentioned when you introduce yourself, you mentioned a, a term that I was going to ask you about, visual anthropology. So sure. all of these things. So if you just uh, tell me now about this project, because I know yeah, it's a big project and I want sure. yeah. people to know well, about I'm, it. I'm, I'm repping it a little bit, right? I'm wearing, I'm wearing, my, I'm wearing my shirt. This is that's, that's the shirt there. There we go. Uh, the project is the animated history of Tibet. Yeah, and um, to me, uh, it is it is what it says. Uh, I'm it's kind of I don't know if it exists really on YouTube, but I'm I'm thinking of it as um, 
long form animated history. So it's a uh, history uh, written by me, but also uh, in collaboration with a bunch of uh, academics, uh, of specialists in Tibetan history from universities all over North America and Europe. And um, we're gonna cover about 1,300 years of Tibetan history, basically from the first uh, written documents, the beginning of the historical record up through the 1960s. Um, and um, I consider it, uh, in a sense, it's critical pedagogy. Um, I, I have an interest in uh, teaching Tibetan language and Tibetan history and um, promoting uh, Tibetan causes on YouTube, on the platform, right, where I think they are dramatically underrepresented. Um, and that's actually detrimental in a, in a direct political sense as well. Um, but um, it's also a, a sort of the culmination of my interest in visual anthropology and the projects that I started in my postdoctoral period. Um, and visual anthropology is a, a sort of pluralistic term. In a sense, it's uh, is the anthropological interrogation of anything visual in the broadest vacuous sense, right? Um, but um, what uh, people very often mean, aside from the study of photographs, visual records, and things like that, is um, uh, uh, documentary filmmaking and ethnographic filmmaking, right? Using film as um, either a pedagogical tool, like for teaching, or using film as a supplement in your ethnographic research, right? And you might think that you just, you're in the field, right? You're with people, and so you just hold up a camera, and there you have your ethnographic record. But um, what you choose to film, why, how it's framed, all have massive implications for ped for pedagogy, for education, but also potentially political uh, uh, ramifications as well. I mean, if you saw like my actual studio space here, it's like a nightmare wasteland of paper, right? But you know, I I, I decided to frame the shot in this way. So so visual anthropology is um, a number, a sort of theoretical tool set for understanding and theorizing. Um, the ways in which people use cameras that way, right? Implicitly and sometimes explicitly and also sometimes implicitly, right? The way that we can do that by accident as well. And that the way we frame and shoot things can betray our own implicit uh, cultural and political biases, right? Um, so yeah, uh, that all grew into the project I'm working on now. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, so another topic that this directly leads into and, and I mentioned that at the beginning about leaving academia so uh, whether you know it is the case with you or not I'm not uh, uh, I don't mean leaving you know for good necessarily but what I mean is and I've spoken about this recently also with uh, uh, with one of my my guests here uh, when we talked about different ways in which you can uh, nowadays and should probably present uh, your you know your research your findings your interests and and we just agreed that it's much more obviously than just you know publishing and, and I, I get this question a lot from people I talk to uh, who ask me you know should I publish do I have to publish what else can I do and I said you know nowadays you can obviously do so many things you can uh, it's, it's just this traditional point of view where uh, where you know your value is being determined by how many publications in academic journals in peer-reviewed journals it in you know journals with a certain impact factor so so it's very it's really limiting your opportunities to shine basically because uh, according to them according to their expectations but fortunately nowadays i know it's been shifting and i always say it's good to produce a blog you know article or start a facebook page or anything else and to basically not just as a hobby which is in my opinion a very important part of it because if you're not you know passionate about it you're not gonna enjoy it uh, but also as you know as an output for outlet for your whatever academic work so so i think what you're doing is it i think it's fair to say that that's what you're doing right with your current work on on this project that's definitely true um i mean i um uh, I, I did enjoy working in institutional academia. I worked as a, a professor of, so, of sociocultural anthropology and then um, a lecturer in Tibetan studies. And, um, you know, the pay was okay. I enjoyed working with students. Um, but what I did not feel like I was having, aside from all my manifold frustrations with academia, was um, an impact on Tibetan cultural causes at all, right? Um, I did a lot of philological work, a lot of history. 
Um, and um, I didn't feel like I was actually doing any good. So I wanted to uh, uh, shift over to what I consider to be public facing research, right? Uh, academic adjacent work um, and um, use my background in anthropology, history and Tibetan area studies to um, sort of in a very small capacity affect some type of positive change as I see it, right? Um, so that's where this project comes from, the Animated History Project, and um, also my work on YouTube in general as well, trying to use my qualitative skill set to just make more accessible uh, pedagogical tools, right, for, for, for people who are still teaching in institutional academia, for students. Um, I mean, I, I, I see that as an inherent good, right? Um, so, so yeah, that was a, for me, it was a natural outgrowth, uh, of my academic work and my uh, growing frustration when I was a working professor with, um, just feeling like I wasn't having an impact beyond, uh, the very small cadre of students that I had in the classroom. Um, also working in universities, man, it, it can be tough. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the publication, uh, work, the, the uh, publisher parish mentality you mentioned, that leads to a lot of sloppy publication, uh, publications and sloppy research. And I was someone who always had the, the kind of field of dreams mentality. I wanted to write fewer, more impactful publications. And um, I realized very quickly that that was not really a viable approach um, as an early career researcher, right, in my field. So um, yeah, a lot of frustrations. And I found that a visual anthropology, uh, but specifically like working on YouTube and pedagogy and um, doing the type of animated history work I'm doing now was not only like personally rewarding, um, but it also uh, can potentially make uh, an impact in the communities that I, that I care about, right? Using like transferable skills. Please come over and check us out. I should also mention just uh, uh, by, by the by that the project is also funded or co uh, uh, partially funded by our co-executive producers, which is uh, Tibet House US, which is um, a Tibetan, an NGO that, that specializes in Tibetan cultural causes. Um, so it's something that you can check out as well at thus.org. Uh, thus um a fabulous organization but yeah uh, come over and, and check out the animated history of tibet yeah it's um i i think as the person running it that it's a fabulous it's a fabulous project